Wow, what a lovely intro. Thank you. And short, which I appreciate. Um, because I, there are a number of things that I'd like to uh, share with you today. Hopefully not for two hours or three hours, but <laughs> let's figure this out here. Okay, good. Um, so I thought when I was thinking about this presentation that I would at least try to um, connect a bit with the theme of the conference. And so I thought, well, learning challenges, assessment solutions. Now, for those of you who know me, um, I can be a little overbearing about the notion of assessment as the cure-all for everything in education. And I certainly don't want to say that today. But I am going to suggest that we look carefully at how assessment can be a more productive and a more integral part of the way we approach learning in our classrooms. And I have to say that I'm really pleased to be here. OK. I will use this. <laughs> Steve, I, I think I've got this on, but maybe not. I'll, I'll try to use this, this mic. Is this better? OK, great. Um, I'm really pleased to be here on many levels. What's not exciting about being in New York? I'm, I'm based in San Francisco. Um, but for me, also, as an instructor at the New School for many years now, this is really my first time in the physical space of this building, this area, this school, and it's very exciting for me. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. But I also enjoy being at conferences like this, where as a teacher and as an educator, I have a chance to listen not only to what a speaker has to say at a podium like this one, or in the sessions we'll go to after this, but also I get a chance to interact with other teachers who have experiences that can complement and enrich my own experiences. And I value that, and I hope you do as well. And I assume you do because you're here. So using experiences, using that interaction as a way of thinking about practice, um, we've I think this is a really a major foundation for how we approach our work as teachers. Of course, we've already had a good deal of experience in classrooms as we went from primary school through middle school, secondary school, post-secondary post, uh, school, university, whatever. And that's OK. We're gonna, are you going to disrobe me now? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> OK, just checking. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Um, and so we've, we also have those experiences to draw on as we think about our practices. And sometimes those experiences have been stellar. We've had teachers. We've had experiences in the classroom that have motivated us, perhaps even brought us to the decision to become educators ourselves. We've also had disappointing experiences. And in my experience, those often are around assessment. And I'll just tell you a quick story about one of my experiences when I was a senior in high school. I thought I was a pretty good writer. I loved to read. And I thought, I'm going to take a class in advanced composition from Mrs. Cranston, who was reputed to be tough but fair. And I thought, this would be great. It would get me ready for college. I could, you know, I'm already a good writer, but you know, this would be really helpful. So I took the class, and I worked hard. I enjoyed the class. I wrote my first paper, taking extra care to pick the right words that would express the nuances of my ideas, turned it, well, typed it on a typewriter, an archaic instrument many of you may never even have seen before, turned it in, and much to my dismay, got it back with a B minus. I was crushed. I was really upset about that. And I thought I would needed to talk to Mrs. Cranston. So I went up after class and I said, you know, I really want to do well in this class. Because I looked at the paper, and the paper had these little red marks on them, like a little check and a little question mark and a little NC, and then the B minus, which seemed huge in comparison. And um, I said, well, what do I need to do in order to get an A? And she said, well, I don't know. I just know an A when I see it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, that's not helpful. <laughs> that's not really going to help me make that leap into the next level of learning that I need to make. And it's that kind of 
thinking about assessment that I think is really problematic in our field. We see instruction as one whole amazing, fabulous, interesting, creative area, and then we see assessment over there on the side as, well, I got to do it, someone's got to do it, I'll do it, but really, that's not what's interesting about teaching. I'm going to suggest that what we need to consider when we think about assessment is that it can be integrated into and become a dyna dynamic part of how we support that bigger circle of learning. So that it's not just assessment for assessment's sake or instruction for instruction's sake, but it's saying how can we use these two parts of our arsenal of tools that we can have at our disposal in the classroom to support our students' learning. What is it that we can do? And so now what I'd like you to do is just to take a moment to think about what you want to know about your students' learning. And learning is our focus. And I want you to think about that and just for a moment, then turn to the person next to you and share your ideas, okay? Just, we're just gonna take 30 seconds to do this because we don't have a lot of time. Think one or two things that you wanna know about student learning. And now talk. <laughs> Okay, now this, ladies and gentlemen, this interaction is exactly why it's interesting to come to a conference like this, but I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, you'll have another opportunity or two to do this. Um, I'm, I've just listed a few things that you might have been talking about. Things like, yeah, I, I, I wanna know whether my students are learning something. Um, are they meeting learning objectives for the course or even for the lesson? Am I doing a good job as an instructor? Am I making connections with my students? Am I meeting their needs? And there are many other kinds of learning needs you may have identified. I'm not going to suggest that assessment can answer all questions, but I am going to suggest that they can support you in addressing these kinds of challenges in setting up effective learning classrooms. Now, we're lucky because, um, huh, the citation didn't quite make it to the slide even though it shows up on my slide here. But there are a number of researchers who've done quite a bit of work on assessment that supports learning. And some terms you may have heard are things like formative assessment, assessment for learning, dynamic assessment. And all of it is really trying to capture this notion that assessment can have a place in the classroom to support learning. And it's based on, on empirical research by people like Black and William and uh, Harlan and Winter and many, many other people who have looked at not only what goes on in the classroom, but what effect that has on student outcomes. So that we can see that there's a relationship between good assessment practice that supports learning and learning itself. Um, so what are some of the characteristics of this kind of an approach to an assessment? When teachers and students understand what the learning targets are, and it's the same idea. And this may seem so obvious, uh, and yet in many classrooms it's not. Um, you may have been in the classroom where you've seen a very active and dynamic number of activities being enacted and it's students are doing something for 10 minutes and then they're seven minutes they're doing something else and then they've got 15 minutes of something else and then there's a wrap up for maybe 20 minutes and it's going like this everyone's engaged there's a lot of talk and you wonder what is it all about what's the purpose why are they why has the teacher chosen those activities versus any other activities and it's not always clear now, I'm not against dynamic and creative and energetic classrooms, but is there a learning target and do students know what the learning target is? Or are they just doing what the teacher tells them to do because that's what they're supposed to be doing at this point in the classroom? It also is helpful if learners know where they are in achieving those learning outcomes and, and where they need to go. So being able to position themselves in their own learning process. Learners also can be active participants in their own learning process 
And I know we've, I'm sure you've spent a lot of time thinking about this in terms of the instructional part of the classroom, but it, they can also be active in terms of the assessment part, in doing self-assessments and peer assessments and things like that, so that they feel that they have some power, some engagement with their own learning process. And that's, that can also be part of the way assessment supports learning. And lastly, unlike in Mrs. Cranston's class, <laughs> learners, learners can learn more if they actually know what they're supposed to do in order to learn. Um, that explicit guidance and how to reach the target is a critical part of effective assessment. So let's see how we can look at that. Now you've seen this one. Okay, linking assessment to learning. This is a, a way that I work with my students to help them see how they can begin to make that link between what the learning objective is and activities and then assessments that can help them guide learning. Now most of us live in the learning activity box or column rather in the middle of this diagram. So for example, if I have a class from 1 to 150, I like to think about what am I going to do at the beginning of class, what am I going to do in the middle of the class, and what am I going to do at the end of the class, how am I going to wrap it up. And so it, it tends to be a schedule of things for people to do. And I don't necessarily, and it, it's, it's, but it's really important, and I think it's something that we need to be consciously thinking about. Why have we chosen these particular activities, as I said before, and what are the, those purposes? What are those learning targets? And a chart like this is a way for sorting out the activities, the learning targets, and then thinking about what kind of assessments do I want to have for this part of the lesson. I'm not suggesting that everything be assessed, but that the choice be purposeful and deliberate. So in this particular one, at the, at the top of the chart, write short descriptive text, there are a list of activities that students could do in order to produce those texts, and then a few ideas for possible assessments to see whether students are achieving not the successful completion of the activity, but rather the learning target in the first column. So this is a way of ensuring that the activities that we have in the classroom the things that we decide to do to support learning are actually tied to learning targets and that assessments are chosen that can provide information for that, not just the successful completion of doing something in the classroom. When students, as I said before, when students are active participants, this also is a way for encouraging their engagement with their learning process and can help them become more, um, become better learners. So what are some of the things that, that can happen when they become active participants? Well, one of the things is that they begin to develop a sense of the criteria that will be used to assess their performances. And this is a way then, if they're actively involved, they can begin to internalize those criteria. They can begin to look at their own work and say, um, gee, is this organized? Is the, am I explaining my ideas in a uh, clear enough way so that people will understand what I'm saying, for example, in a writing assignment? Um, they can begin to look at those performances and say, here's my strengths, here are my weaknesses. Um, they can develop more responsibility for their own learning, and this is really important And for those of you who work with adults. As we want to encourage learners to become lifelong learners, it helps them develop that sense of responsibility that yes, they can do this. They can develop a sense of how well they're doing, what they, where areas in which they still need to develop. So um, again, student engagement, critical area for development. Now the last piece that I talked about earlier about explicit guidance is something that we do as teachers all the time in the classroom. Um, during student performances, if they're engaged in a role play, if you want to involve, uh, work with them in a question answer sequence, in a sense, that's a kind of an assessment process that we're engaging in because we are delivering guidance, we're, de we're delivering feedback, we're helping to scaffold those performances in a way that supports student learning. 
Um, of course, I think many, many of us are familiar with the after performance kind of assessment techniques such as rating scales, um, scoring guides, uh, comments on papers, uh, error correction, observations. Those are the kinds of things that often are typically considered the heart of assessment. I'm just suggesting we can see assessment as a broader, as a broader term here as we work at figuring out how we're supporting learning. And then at a remove from a, from a particular performance, we can see things such as portfolios, learning logs, uh, language inventories, reflections, things like that as ways of thinking back on performances and at progress over time in learning and moving along the path of learning. So what are some of the common features of teacher feedback? that people have talked about in the literature. And I, let me just put a plug in right now for Bichner and Storch's uh, written corrective feedback for L2 development. That is um, a really wonderful compilation of the literature, the research literature on written corrective feedback and um, really thoughtful analysis of models of learning that are supported by these different approaches to feedback. Um, Basically, what they're saying is one size does not fit all, so you're going to have to try out a lot of different kinds of things, but they do it in a much more elegant way and with a great model. Uh, I just would like to, again, suggest if you're interested in, in feedback techniques, this is a, a, a great book to look for. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we can describe teacher feedback um, in terms of what's getting focused on, the area of the content. Um, the extent of the feedback, is it going to be uh, for on everything? Our students often want us to give feedback on every single thing that they produce, and yet is that what we really need to do or want to do? Um, what there are various kinds of strategies that we can use in providing feedback. It could be direct, indirect, coded, uncoded. Uh, again, there's a large literature on this area that you, you may or may not be terribly familiar with, but. Uh, and we all have our own systems probably for providing feedback to students. Um, and then whether or not there's going to be an opportunity for revision. Uh, to me, if you give feedback and you don't provide an opportunity for revision, it's sort of like, hmm, <laughs> where, where is that going to go? But that's just my thinking. So now, after all of this, going through some of the literature, some of these characteristics of effective uses of assessment for supporting learning, I'd like to have you engage in some assessment. And to do that, in your handout, you have a sample of writing. And the sample looks like this. It says, assessing EFL, ESL writing, promoting learning with formative assessment, and there's a writing sample right there. It's not very long. And then there's a description of the instructional task, the piece of writing, and then the place for your notes. And that's the only page I'd like you to take out right now from your handout. So what I'd like you to do now is to just look through the instructional task. And it says, the following piece of writing is by a student named Miguel in a fourth, fifth grade class of low intermediate level students. The teacher has asked students to write about their favorite country. And then you have a writing sample. So right now, look at the writing sample and then make some notes about what you would say to Miguel. Okay. Now I'd like you to look at the same piece of writing, but I'd like you to use one of the tools that I've also given you for explicit feedback. And that's the next page of your handout. It has an analytic scoring guide at the top, a peer assessment checklist, and a rating scale with targeting writing features as the title. Okay, now you're gonna be looking at, we're, we're gonna, what we're gonna do in this activity is we're gonna look at the same piece of writing you've just made comments about. And now what you're gonna do is you're going to look at it 
with a specific tool. Now, an analytic scoring guide, I'm sure you've seen this before, has descriptions along the rating scale and component parts of the skill area being looked at uh, in, a, in a long column. So things like development, organization, convention, sentence structure, and then it's all put against a four-point scale with specific descriptions for each point on the scale. So for the teacher, a guide like this presents a way of matching a student performance against a standardized or consistent to assessment tool. So that in a class, going from student to student to student, you're looking at the same performances with one consistent I, if you will, which is provided by this, this tool. For the student, getting a score on an analytic scoring guide, say the student is a level two, the student sees what the where he or she is and sees where the learning target is, not just as a number, but it's actually a description of a language performance that provides, I would suggest, a clearer picture of the target than just saying A <laughs> or four <laughs> or something like that. So it's, again, it's this idea of providing explicit guidance to help students progress from point A to point B with the learning target clearly described. Now the peer assessment checklist right below it is an example of a tool that can be used for students to again begin to internalize those criteria. Again, a different tool looking at the same piece of writing but with a slightly different purpose in mind so that assessment can again help to support learning. Not just to get a grade on something, which we know is important in institutions, but also to help to develop student learning. The third tool that you're going to look at is, um, is a rating scale. And here, the, the kinds of things that are just described uh, in the analytic scoring guide are broken down into more component skill areas, like um, using capitalization and lowercase, use periods, commas. Those things are all embedded in their, under conventions. But if your classroom is working on these kinds of things and your students are learning these kinds of things, you get a chance to actually tick off where they are. And what's nice about this kind of a tool is that there's a way to show progress over time so that the same tools used multiple times so students see where they are, if they're making progress, and where they still need to continue to work. So going back to the activity now <laughs> that I've explained all of these, I'd like you to look at these pieces of writing and work with two other people. So you need to kind of figure out how to do that in a fixed seat auditorium on a, on a ramp. Um, maybe turning around, I don't know, <laughs> motioning people to come on over. But the idea is that I'd like you to work with two other people, each of you using a different instrument, and kind of see how you look at this piece of writing once you've used this kind of guided feedback. OK? Any questions about the activity? And we're going to take, we're going to take actually four minutes, four whole minutes to do this. These are the kinds of tools that help us in our work, I think, because when we are using assessment tools that provide us with useful information about student learning, that gives us a basis for helping to develop lessons that zero in on areas where students still need additional work. And it also gives us a way of reflecting back on our own instruction. Are we being effective? If all of the students, for example, looking at, uh, looking at the uh, analytic scoring guide, if all of the students show no development in their work, uh, that may suggest <laughs> that additional <laughs> lessons or units on development may be in order. So again, assessment can really provide a lot of, a real range of um, useful information. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of all of this because we are coming to the end of our time together today. And um, I'm going to come to 
the last piece of information on your handout, which is how do you rate the assessments in your class using some of the ideas that I've been talking about and hopefully you've been talking about in your interaction with people in your groups. And things like, are your, assess are your assessments closely related to the learning aims in your class? Are you using assessments that can provide you with information about learning? Or are the assessments just the things that, that are at the back of the current book you're using that may or may not reflect what you do in your classroom with your students? Are your assessments related to what your students want to learn? Are they getting feedback that they're going to find useful for their own learning needs, for why they're in your classroom? Do they know the learning aims in your class? Do they know why they're doing the activities that they're engaging in, that you've created in order to help them learn? Do they know the criteria that you use when you're scoring a language performance? Do they know what counts? Do they know what an A looks like? And can they use those criteria to look at their own work and the work of their peers? So just take a moment. Well, actually, we don't have a moment. It's kind of over. But um, take a moment anyway. I'd like you to take a moment anyway to, to, to think about that. But um, actually, what I'd like to do is hear from you. I'd like to hear some questions, some concerns, um, things that you'd like. I, I'm just going to tack on a few more minutes here, because I really would like to hear in this direction now. So thoughts? I like this. Ahas? <laughs> Anything that you'd like to? you'd like to share? And I have a hard time seeing because of these lights. Yes? Uh, sometimes I get hung up on these analytic rubrics. Um, because in that top row it says, you know, to achieve a four, uh, topic is addressed and developed effectively. And effective for me still has somewhat of a subjective feel. And if I were to tell a student, like, oh, like, what do you need to get a four? You should be more effective. It's, you know, it doesn't provide them much support. So. I, I really like to use these, and then I fall and I end up in these pitfalls where I'm like, how am I going to explain what effective development is, or so on? So, yeah, I, I think that's really that's really a, a good point. Teachers who use analytic scoring guides effectively, I think, also provide samples of student performances that exemplify what this looks like, what a four looks like, what a three looks like, what a two looks like. Um, a colleague of mine in Taipei. She's chair of the department, and she, what she does is she just has papers, scored papers in different areas on the wall so teachers themselves can see what it looks like so that as a department they have consensus. Because it's terrible, it's, it's, it's a really tough thing for a student to go from class to class to class and find out that what worked really well for my class you know, did not work for your class uh, because we had different criteria. So, Trying to develop a sense of shared criteria is really important, and you need really examples of these things as a way to uh, exemplify uh, what, what these criteria mean, because these are squishy, effective, um, yeah, clear evidence, clear, you know, that, I think it's pretty clear when you say clear evidence, but is that two pieces? Is it three pieces? Yeah. Other questions, other ahas? Question? Uh, you presented to us uh, writing assessment, but how about assessing oral proficiency, oral language? Sure. You can use the exact same tools, <laughs> only make it oral performances. So there, there are, I, if you'd like to speak with me afterwards, I'm, I'm more than happy to give you some ideas of, uh, of references, but there are, our, the, the field of assessment does not lack in examples of assessment tools. So there are books on, um, TESOL publishes, um, books on assessment, and there are lots of books sh showing rubrics and scoring guides and rating scales and all of these tools, and, and a lot on oral language proficiency, looking at fluency, looking at pronunciation, looking at um, performance uh, criteria for uh, um, oral presentations, because that's a different kind of uh, oral language skill. Uh, so we, we have a lot of tools out there. It's, if there's one thing you should think about when you begin looking at tools, is what, am, what information am I, am I going to get from this tool, and how can it 
serve the purposes not only for me as a teacher, but for my students as well. And that's why I wanted to show you three different kinds of tools here and some of the characteristics that give them different, uh, be different benefits, if you will, in using them. But there are many tools, and, and I can, we can go down to the publisher's exhibit, and you'll probably find a lot of them there, lots on oral language. Because it's, oral language is so much harder to do um, assessment with because it's ephemeral. Some people, some teachers, actually record performances so they can look at it again and think about it and be very deliberative. And um, there are some interest, there are some interest, teachers have done things like have speaking portfolios where they have students record pieces, like, inter, like a role play, and add on to those uh, recordings over time so students themselves can see the development of oral skills. And of course, if it's recorded, then you can use, it's much easier to use a rubric. But you can, st but as we know from big um, tests like the Cambridge suite of exams and things like that, that there are many speaking tests now that are scored uh, on, at the moment using things like rubrics. Um, Hold on. I think I have it on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you.